that this is of interest to you. This is going to be a presentation that Rebecca and I were invited to give in January at a meeting about Toshio Osaka at the National Museum of Ethnology in Osaka. And unfortunately, couldn't do it because of the epidemic. And so what I'm going to give you is what they asked that I prepare for them. And that is a history of the academy in relative to Toshio Aseda and his legacy at the academy. And that's what I'm trying to uh, do right now. If you were lucky enough to see the old academy before it was taken down, you would have seen the African annex and the animals that he had uh, taxidermied. He was at the academy for more than 40 years, and he did many of the illustrations for the dioramas. For the He created many of the dioramas, and he also did all of the fish legends that were so gorgeous. And a lot of that's in storage, and I hope a lot of it will come back out. Uh, this is going to be an experience for me because I confess that I'm counting on Rebecca to make me seem sensible. And this is going to be a good experiment. And if you don't know the Academy's history, I hope you will be inspired to read many of the books that have been written about the Academy recently. And you can then uh, pursue that as well. So now I am going to ask Rebecca Albright to kindly move us forward. And here we are in, uh, in San Francisco. This is the way that San Francisco looked in 1850. And it was really the most extraordinary town right after the gold rush. And it was a small town. Next slide. And as we go forward, uh, the Academy All right, you there we go. The Academy was uh, founded in 1853 and a group of gentlemen got together and founded the Academy, but at the same time uh, they invited women to join, which is really quite remarkable. The academy was unique in so doing. And it was the oldest in the western United States. And it's really uh, come a long way since then. And I am having difficulty with, uh, with, there we go. The first building was down uh, Market Street. Actually, it was in the Congregational Church and then moved to Market Street. And that was uh, really two buildings. And it had a research section. And it also had a public display section and a library. And people from all around America and Europe came to visit the academy. Next slide. In its early history, it had uh, some famous people in its membership, John Muir. The, uh, the society was actually uh, founded there and the, at the academy. John Burroughs, a famous naturalist, was there. And Andrew Randall was, uh, became its first president. Next slide. And all went well until in a card game, Randall was accused of cheating and a gambler shot him, killed him. And the Academy's proceedings reported that uh, that after the uh, meeting, the publication of trees was described and a number of other things were described, scientific matters, and then the group went to uh, Randall's funeral and uh, Harrington's hanging. Next slide. Can I have the next slide, please? 
And the Market Street Academy was actually in 1891, and that was given to the Academy by James Lick, the so-called miserly millionaire, but he supported science, and it was down in Market Street and Forth, and it was uh, a great institution, and it provided the money that's made the Academy possible. And the Market Street was really quite something, and the museum was doing very well until you know what happened. Next slide. And that was the disaster of the 8.0 magnitude earthquake on April 18th. The academy was ruined and the earthquake and fire did so much damage that we were lucky to save anything. And a lot of the, uh, the archives were removed and the holotypes of plants were taken. Alice Eastwood became famous for saving the type specimens of the botany collection. And there wasn't that much left of the academy. But in 1906, they destroyed the academy using dynamite and things accumulated in San Francisco and there really wasn't much of a way to save them. San Francisco was a whaling port. And so many things from the South and Central Pacific came to San Francisco and were donated to the society, but uh, they didn't have anywhere to stole them. And coincidentally, the Academy had its Galapagos expedition in 1905 to 1906. They left before the earthquake and they went and made the largest collections ever made of Galapagos specimens. And they returned to discover that the San Francisco had been destroyed, but uh, they got money from the city because Golden Gate Park had not been damaged by the earthquake. And there were large camps of people in the earthquake in 1910, a bond issue and funds came from the uh, city and they uh, rebuilt what was called North American Hall and in 1923, they built and opened the Steinhardt Aquarium, which was the largest aquarium in America. And it was really quite something. It was free, open to the public. It had long, luminous hallways. And those displays were really quite something. If you'd ever seen the old aquarium, you saw that it had been retrofitted. But still, this is what it looked like in those days. And the lights were then taken down and the lights came from the aquarium tanks. And the illustrations above the tanks and before the tanks were done by Aceda and others. And they John, were re rear Can Excuse you hear me, me Rebecca? Um, yeah. I just wanted to remind you to please say next so that I can make sure I'm on the same slide as you. Good, I'm uh, looking at the Steinhardt Aquarium 1923. Do you see that slide? Perfect, I found it, thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please. And Templeton Crocker was grandson of one of the Crockers that built the Central Pacific Railway. And Templeton Crocker purchased the Zaka. And the Zaka was a wonderful yacht that he took around the world several times and he, uh, it was used by Zane Gray, the Western writer, for fishing. And at that time, he brought Toshio Aceda to help him and to illustrate specimens. And here you can see Templeton Crocker on deck sorting the specimens. And this was really quite important to the Academy. And so the Zaka went around the world and there were many trips aboard the Zaka. But it gave Toshio Aceda an opportunity to uh, work at the academy. And he then from there went to the, uh, went to the American Museum of Natural History and illustrated a lot of things for them, was the taxidermist for them. And his time with the academy really began 
during the uh, expeditions aboard the Zaka. Aceda was born in 1893 in Japan, and he came as a student from Tokyo, and he became a taxidermist at the American Museum of Natural History. But he wanted to be in San Francisco. He just felt comfortable in San Francisco, and so he became an artist in the ichthyology department in 1925. And in 1940, he opened a, photo, a photographic studio, and he and his wife were doing fine downtown until the war broke out, and he was interred in Topaz, Utah. And next slide, please. And he, uh, here you see him uh, from the Templeton Crocker expedition. And Toshio was said to be the first Japanese citizen to go to the Galapagos Islands. He was quite a hiker, quite a photographer, great illustrator, great writer. He wrote a book about the Galapagos. And here he is at Mount Crocker that he climbed with uh, Crocker himself. And then he, then in 1932, as I said, was interred upon his return to California. And while he was interred, the FBI investigated him as a spy. And Rebecca Kim, doing research with this, discovered that J. Edgar Hoover had written a letter suggesting that we should pursue this and see what he had done as a spy and finally dropped the matter and Tosho was allowed to finally released and came back to the academy. And in 1949, he started working at the academy. And I, why have I done that? Let me get to this slide and you can see that uh, during the Galapagos expedition, he illustrated many fishes. And that was probably the most important thing that he did for science at that time. He uh, was a great watercolor artist and he would do incredibly beautiful illustrations of the fish when fresh right out of the water. And here you can see a photograph of a fresh fish photographed by Paul Human, an underwater photographer, in his watercolor illustration. Once fish are put into form one and in alcohol as you know they their color fades and so a lot of the uh, illustrations that Aceda had made were uh, used in scientific publications next slide here are other fishes that he had illustrated for the galapagos expedition alongside of a fresh specimen next slide and here you can see really how remarkably similar they are. And I must say that this fish, the Bodianus, is variable in coloration. And I think that Asena has done a better job than even the photograph. Next slide. And this gorgeous fish, Xanthicthes mento, is uh, much prettier in his illustration than it is in a photograph. Next slide. And this is really quite something. This is uh, a watercolor that he had done of Oplognathus. And that was very special because Oplognathus also lives in Japan. And he was very proud of this illustration. Next slide. He also illustrated insects, reptiles, and he uh, did a lot of things that were very useful to science and are now useful at the time when people just don't have opportunities to collect these in some locations. And here are some squid that he had photographed, cuttlefish that he had photographed in 1932. Next slide. And now this is what I had prepared for the uh, Osaka Museum. And they wanted to know what's become of the Academy. And the Academy, as you know, has uh, added and removed large buildings. Next slide. And here is the current aquarium, which is really quite dramatic. Next slide. 
And here's the footprint of the old academy in 1960. And next slide. And here's the African Hall showing animals that he had taxidermied. And he had prepared a lot of these mounts for these, uh, for these dioramas. And it was really quite important. This is the next slide showing the star projector. This is for the purposes of the overseas audience. Next slide. And we have, more or less, I haven't counted lately. I'm sure that somebody can help me. About 46 million plants and animals in the collection. Next slide. And we have a lot of researchers. I will introduce him if you don't remember what he looked like when he had dark hair. But that's Frank Almeida, who is retired, and he still comes in to work at the academy. Next slide. And we have students and researchers working here. Next slide. In 1989, the next earthquake, the next significant earthquake, and that was enough 6.9 that we had to consider either rebuilding the core earthquake, damaged academy, or level it and start over. And we leveled all but one portion of the academy, so that it was a rebuild. And that's really the modern history of the academy. Now back to Toshio. He arrived at the museum in 1949. And he had been at Caltech. He had been at his downtown photographic studio. He really had quite lovely handwriting. And his English was absolutely fantastic. And he wrote to R.C. Miller and asked if he could get a job. And R.C. Miller offered him a job at the exorbitant salary of $3,000 a year. And it turned out to be just wonderful. And R.C. Miller then uh, was able to give him a full-time job. R.C. Miller spoke with me on numerous occasions talking about Aceda because they were close in while he was here at the academy. Next slide. And here you see him in the exhibits department. I think that that warthog is still in the collection, and I believe that this tortoise is still in the collection. And next slide. You can see him here with Cecil Totes, who is really a famous exhibit designer, and Totes told R.C. Miller that having Toshio as his assistant was fabulous because Toshio was, was like a ballet artist. He could walk around the dioramas without breaking anything. And he really had a great sense of the creation of dioramas. And here he is creating the African Annex diorama. Next slide. And here you can see him walking on tree limbs and balancing, and he just was very, very careful. Next slide. And there they are working on the water buffalo exhibit, if you remember seeing that in the old academy. And he finally, in 1965, retired. Here in the, in the far left is George Lindsay. And... Uh, on the far right, you'll see uh, Earl Harold, and uh, he uh, he really didn't stay around the academy at all. He uh, went with his wife to live in the hills above the academy, and had uh, a garden that he tended for quite a while. And he really was an amazing man. He. Uh, he, in his life, wrote an opera, wrote a play. He wrote several books in Japanese. He did many, many illustrations that were used at the Academy and elsewhere, and in publications. A number of new species of fish were named after him, and deservedly so. At the 
current academy, this picture is a couple of years old, but I think that he would appreciate the fact that more than a billion and a half of annual visitors came to the academy before we had to shut down. And hopefully we will soon be able to have guests like this on a regular basis. Next slide. But I guess the most important guests are guests like this that can fall in love with life on Earth and learn to care about it. And next slide. That endeth my presentation. And if you have any questions, I will attempt to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. That was wonderful. Very insightful. Um, I love hearing about the, the history of the Academy um, and about Toshio's legacy. So just looking at the chat function, we don't have any questions yet. Um, if you have a question, feel free to type it in and or just um, indicate that you have one for the chat and I'd be happy to either unmute you or you can unmute yourself and ask John. We have um, plenty of time. We have a over half an hour, so <laughs> we probably won't utilize all of that for questions, but. Um. Don't be shy. You can correct me for all the errors that I've just made, might have made. Hello, John, this is Darrell. Thank you for Hi, the Darrell. presentation. Um, You're welcome. I'm really excited about the Galapagos. So can you tell us more about the time he spent there and what the what the outcome of the expeditions were? Yeah, he was there for quite a while, about six months, and they were large collecting expeditions. And the Zaka itself really inspired others to go to the Galapagos. It didn't come back with that much uh, material because we had already been there and we had collected so much at that time. There were a number of, of fishes and specimens had been trawled. So there were things that were unavailable to uh, the Academy after its 1905-06 expedition. So the Zaka did do quite a bit of trawling and dredging and those specimens are still in the collection and uh, a number of a number of papers were written about those expedition those that expedition they also went to uh, mexico during that that trip and made a lot of collections in mexico offshore in the eastern pacific but i think that just the fact that he was there doing the illustrations is very important. And that for the first time gave, gave color images to the animals that uh, were not available in the 1905-1906. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, John, we have a few more questions. Um, Emily, would you like to unmute yourself? And I'm happy to read these out, but if you'd like to ask directly. Sure, sorry. Um, you mentioned the, all of the, the Zaka expeditions. Are most of those in our collection or were they? Um, actually, uh, some are, but many are not actually. Uh, what Crocker did was to make the Zaka available to other institutions, charge them rent, and they ended up uh, at the American Museum, including a a trip to Easter Island that they had made, and he got he got one of the moa, and brought that back. But that ended up uh, in the American Museum, not at the Academy. So uh, a lot of it is at museums across the country, but not all. Uh, oh, and some of it went back to Caltech too. All right. And did, what happened to the boat? Is it still floating or? Zaka is still afloat. It is, uh, it was purchased by Errol Flynn, the, the mad, the mad New Zealand actor. And then Errol Flynn 
sold it and it kind of it went into San Francisco Bay and just was ruined. It was absolutely ruined. And finally, it was purchased by someone in uh, Monaco, where it now exists. It was rebuilt. And he has, in fact, thought about taking another cruise of the Zaka. He hasn't done it yet, but he has uh, rebuilt it in the old style, a very wealthy gentleman in Monaco. Wow, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. We had another question from Mike Schmidt. Mike. Hello. Uh, great talk. Thank you very much. I'm, my apologies. I came in late. I was wondering if uh, any of Toshio's original drawings are available for viewing at the Academy. Yes. They have been on a display on numerous occasions. And when we first reopened the new Academy, we had a large Galapagos exhibit. And there was a quite large display about Toshio with some of his illustrations. Currently, I don't believe that any of his uh, art is is on display, but that can certainly be corrected. It's all in storage. John, this is Barb. Um, I actually had, uh, when we were reopening the new academy, I had his uh, paintings of the Africa Hall dioramas, his study paintings, they're mm. small. I had them redone and they're actually on display in the Academy store in the small um, dioramas that are up, that go around the top of the store. Um, so you can go in there and when we get to go back and actually see his study drawings for Africa Hall. Oh, fabulous. Oh, thank you, Barb. I, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, yeah. What do you think of them, having seen them? Uh, they're they're great. You can tell, um, you know, which uh, a couple of the dioramas were still um, were replicated. So hmm. you can see that. But then others, um, there was one that um, I remember uh, um, they hid certain you know, it was a very bushy, jungly diorama and they hid certain um, I for, I, uh, invertebrates throughout the bushes and you had to try and find them when you looked ah. at the diorama. But that, that it had a lot of bamboo and I can't remember which, which antelope was, or uh, was in there, but um, anyway, there. Oh, that's uh, great. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you for tipping me to that. <laughs> sure. Um, Rebecca Johnson had a question. Yes, Rebecca. Hi, John. Hi, John. Thanks so much. Um, it was a nice trip down memory lane, thinking a lot about the old academy and missing it a lot. So thanks for that. Um, I had a question about Toshio and his family um, during World War II, and I was wondering if they were interred or if it, and if you don't know, maybe Rebecca knows. Um, and if so, did the academy have anything to say? And did we have other Japanese or Japanese American employees at the time? I do know that he was interred in Topaz, Utah, and it was the high desert. And he and his wife, Suzuto, uh, were there, and he taught art, and he taught, he taught, I think he taught American history, and he also taught stone polishing. And he, uh, he always, he never thought that he was conscripted and didn't say that publicly. I mean, he always, just said that he was away as if he were on vacation. He was very kind about that. And uh, when he got back, he, uh, as quickly as he could, tried to get back to work at the academy. And it took him a few years. And ironically, at the academy, in the old uh, oh, what, oh, North American Hall, we had a... Uh, a lens grinding facility during the war. And so during the war, Robert R.C. Miller had set up a, uh, a location for lens as uh, bomb sites to be created at the academy. And so while he was there in, in an internment camp, we were making bomb sites in uh, 
North American Hall. And were other Japanese at the Academy at the time? Not that I know of. Uh, somebody might know. I don't know. I, I, just, I just don't know. There was no one on the old aquarium staff by any means. And uh, none that I know of. This is Rebecca Kim. Sorry, John. I'm just going to. Oh, please, Rebecca, everything? correct everything I've said. No, um, I'm just going to add, at the time when um, to Koshio was interred, he was not an employee at the Academy. He actually owned his own photography right. studio in San Francisco. So he did <laughs> lose that business as part of um, being relocated. Um, so, and, at the, and I have not seen any records of any Japanese Americans or Japanese um, employees at the Academy during that time period. So um, I can just, but yeah, and he, yeah, he was at Topaz. He did draw, there are a few of his watercolors of the internment camps, um, I think at the Smithsonian. There's a, there's a list of resources a few of us have gathered of, uh, uh, of Toshio's work that aren't at the Academy. So he is, we have mostly his paintings that he took from the Galapagos expedition, but his personal paintings are at, in Osaka at the Museum of Ethnology, which is mm -hmm. how, which is who had invited John to give this talk. Um, they have his personal artwork. So we have like a list of other places that also have some of his work. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, I didn't mean to suggest that he was at the Academy really until the late forties, although he did first get hired in 1927 at the Academy to uh, be, be an artist in the ichthyology department. But that was a short term position. It looks like there's another question from Gail. Gail, I don't know if your previous question about illustrations was answered. Um, yeah. But if you yeah. have another. Yeah, it's kind of along the same lines. It just struck me as a very kind of courageous political move to hire someone who had been interned and had had been investigated as a spy. Um, so it seemed like maybe that was kind of a, I wondered if that was something the Academy would have faced political pressure from, or if that was an unusual move that they made at that time. It was an unusual move, I suggest. And, but San Francisco was San Francisco even then. And they were willing to do what they did. They had to get permission uh, to hire him. But once he was here, no problem at all, and he was well respected, and he and his wife felt very comfortable in San Francisco. The other cities, Pasadena when he was at Caltech, uh, New York when he was at the American Museum, he just didn't feel comfortable. But in San Francisco, he felt very comfortable. Uh, great. Well, it looks like, unless there are any other questions, I'll give a few moments for people to um, speak up a little bit. Those are all the questions that are in the comment box. Well, I uh, hope that the majority of the symposia from now on will be uh, easier to listen to. And <laughs> you'll have Rebecca Albright uh, to make sense out of the speaker's words. And I can't Thank you all enough for listening and look forward to hearing the next symposium. This was wonderful. Thank